Good evening, everyone. This is Terry Hutchinson. I'm one of your hosts here on Interpreter Radio. And we've got uh, Kevin Christensen online with us today, one of my co-hosts. Good evening, Kevin. How are you today? Good evening, Terry. It's nice to be here. Good. And then we have a special guest with us. So normally our co-host is John Gee. John was unable to be with us today. And uh, so we've got a special guest with us, Don Bradley. So, Don, we're going to test your microphone here. Hello, everyone. There we go. I think we have you. Great. Okay, Good welcome. So Don has just published a new book. It's called The Lost 116 Pages, and it's put out by Greg Coford Books, and we'll be talking with Don a little more about that later in the program. But we want to mention to you at the beginning of the program that we are sponsored by the Interpreter Foundation, which is a volunteer group that every week since 2012 has put out at least one Internet article featuring issues or uh, involving Latter-day Saint issues, interests, history, doctrine, uh, a lot of things. My co-host, John Gee, has put out two of those articles since the last time we were here. And uh, Don published one a couple of weeks ago, which yeah. is an excerpt from your book. Yes, it is. So we'll be talking to Don a little more about that. But we did have some sad news this week that we wanted to announce, and that is that Dr. William Hamlin, from BYU passed away unexpectedly, and I believe it was Tuesday. And uh, he was one of the co-founders of Interpreter. Now, I had very little contact with him, but I will tell you that his work influenced me greatly ever since I was a young man. I'm not, surprisingly, I'm not very much younger than he is. Um, and uh, I just remember he edited a book on warfare in the Book of Mormon that was very influential to me early on. He was one of the original members, or at least one of the very early members of FARMS, the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies. It was later uh, brought into BYU and then later morphed into what's called the Neil A. Maxwell Institute, and um, it's quite different than what it originally was. And when, uh, when FARMS went to BYU, Dr. Hamlin bowed out. He felt it should be a bit more independent. And uh, then when Interpreter was founded, he helped found that and has been a contributor ever since. And he, in fact, the, the book that influenced me the most and influenced some friends of mine in very positive ways when they needed it was called Solomon's Temple, a book he oh, co-wrote with yes. David Rolf yes. Seeley. And so uh, our, our thoughts and prayers are going out to his family. And for those of you who may not be aware, um, now you are. But uh, I know that Don and Kevin Christensen both have had contact with him, so I'm going to invite each of them to say something about that. First of all, Don, we'll have you do that. Sure. So, you know, I have kind of an interesting, uh, unusual history with Bill because I first knew him as a kind of antagonist. <laughs> I... Um, there was a time when I had, in my adult life, when I had left the church completely, I'd stopped believing, had my name removed from the records, and I was uh, online a lot on message boards debating uh, with Latter-day Saints, critiquing Latter-day Saint apologetics, and sometimes foundational claims. And, you know, um, there was an exchange where I could tell that Bill and Dan Peterson recognized that I was sincere in my search for truth, and that seemed to really um, make a difference to Bill uh, and to Dan. And um, when I came back to the church after being out for five years, I was actually afraid in some ways that I really wouldn't be accepted because I had, um, you know, debated with Laudy Saints, criticized the church, uh, for a long time and been on the outside. And, you know, Dan Peterson and Bill and I got together for lunch one day, and Dan had to leave kind of early, but Bill and I stayed there for maybe three hours. And I think if practical considerations hadn't needed to come into play, we could have sat there for three days. And he was extremely open to ideas that I had that uh, might have seemed that I was afraid he would think were unusual. And um, just uh, he gave me a copy, in fact, of his Solomon's Temple book and was just really accepting and really helpful. 
he was supportive of your work, and and uh, you've been working on this book that we'll talk about for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And he kind of helped you with that too, didn't he? He gave he gave good ideas. He he loved exploring ideas, and yeah, the fact that I could tell how warmly he accepted me. You know, he was. He was very uh, staunch. I I was going to say, he was known to be very uh, combative in terms of the intellectual realm and defending the church and and Joseph and the the doctors. Yeah, but here's something that I've come to recognize about Bill that I didn't for a long time that puts that into perspective. If you look at the column that he and Dan Peterson wrote for several years for the Deseret News on world religions, Mm -hmm. you would be hard-pressed to find two devout individuals in any faith who are as respectful of and open to the good in other faiths. So that that tells you a lot about Bill right there. I think part of the reason he reacted so strongly against critics of the church is that he was someone who gave respect to the faiths of others, and he expected others to do that. Yeah. So he, he would be particularly antagonistic, if you will, not, not really defensive, I should say, when somebody was more antagonistic, maybe, than, than was reasonable or, or polite. Yeah. He thought that people had should have better things to do with their lives than to attack mm-hmm. someone else's religion. Yeah. Now, Kevin, you've uh, you've known Bill for a long time, I understand. Well, I've known him as an online presence, you know, since I got, I got involved with farms very, very early on, uh, at least on the mailing list, and started reading his papers. And then when the Internet came along, uh, he was a... Uh, he and Dan Peterson and several others you know, were, a, were a presence. And so I'd, I'd be reading his essays and got to know him through his essays and, and through his posts. And uh, <laughs> and then it, uh, eventually, I, when I started publishing things myself, at one point, uh, when I ran across Margaret Barker's work and decided this is something that I want to write something about. And so I, I asked Dan Peterson, you know, that, has anybody done anything with Margaret Barker's work? And he said, he sent me to... Uh, contacts Bill Hamlin, at, and Bill Hamlin was doing a season, uh, a series for the uh, Maxwell Institute you know, for Farms called the Occasional Papers. There would just be something that you know might be too long to fit in a in a book, just something that he thought was interesting. So uh, he said that yeah, I should go ahead, you know, encourage me to work on it. So I, I worked on uh, sent him a, after a, a year of working on it, sent him the first draft, and it came back with just four succinct remarks on it, but they were. But on point, that it, I had to go back to work for another year to get it right. <laughs> and I, I've, I've always been impressed with that. That you know, he didn't, you, you didn't mark all over the paper. He just, you know, had four little comments on there. And uh, it, one, one of the things had to do with structure, and he proposed the structure. And uh, I didn't use his suggestion, but the idea that there was something wrong with it was, was, you know, apt. And so uh, I worked on it. And uh, and then when. Uh, uh, you know, the paper came out in 2002, and and I, you know, sent a copy to Margaret, and then uh, Noel Reynolds went and visited Margaret, and out of that they invited her to BYU in 2003, and it was I, I came out there for her visit, and that's you know and during that week uh, I went and had lunch with Bill, and he took me to a Brazilian steakhouse, and we just sat and talked. He was just a real sweetheart, you know, he's very incredibly knowledgeable, and it you know it's startling to me even at this point. You know that I'm 65 as well, and he was he, he was 65 when he died, and it just seems like he, he accomplished a great deal in his life. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, he he published so much, and uh, yeah, not not a lot recently, but early on he was right there on the forefront of of defending the Book of Mormon, of exploring new areas, uh, you know, writing about it, and and uh, really, like I said, in fact. Didn't he do the? Was it he or Dan that did the introduction to your occasional paper? Uh, it was I Bill. I think it was him. Bill yeah. Did the yeah, and that's yeah. when that I got Bill. that's when I got my introduction to Margaret Barker was through you, and it, it, it's really mm-hmm. led me here, and it it changed a lot of the way I've read the scriptures, particularly the Book of Mormon, as we'll discuss a little bit later. So, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he uh, my contact with him, as I said, was very limited. He was at a he was at a conference up at Utah State talking about temples, and he he had uh, given a paper, and I I had a source that I'd been working on something else that uh, I thought would have helped him, and and so I just mentioned it to him. He was very gracious and thanked me for for pointing that source out to him, and uh, you know that's about it. 
So I really have limited time with him. But I would encourage those of you who are listening uh, to go back and take a look at Bill's work. And once again, we'd like to keep him and his family in our prayers and thoughts. And uh, especially, I think Bill would be appreciative to know that uh, we're going to press on tonight and we're going to talk about the Book of Mormon in great detail and with great enthusiasm and passion. And uh, that really was something he was all about. So I'm into that. <laughs> I, uh, I would also encourage you to go to Dan Peterson's column because he and Dan were extremely close. Dan is the president of the uh, Interpreter Foundation, and they've worked together ever since the early days of farms, probably yeah. 40 years, going on 40 years, I think. Well, not quite 40, but 30. Was it early 80s? They've known each other since they were doing graduate work, something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. So anyway, yes. all right. Well, Kevin, we um, have brought Don Bradley in tonight, kind of as a substitute for John Gee here. But um, seriously, Don has just released a new book called The Lost 116 Pages, Reconstructing the Book of Mormon's Missing Stories. It's published by Greg Coford Books. It's available in the soft cover from twenty nine ninety five. You can get it uh, at various locations. You can also get it on ebook. From Amazon, I would presume it's on Nook. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. It's definitely on Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. They're the hardcover Kindle. is coming out uh, shortly. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's easily available on Kindle. And uh, this book, I have to tell you, I've been hearing about it for years. <laughs> and uh, I have a I have a book show that I do in St. George every day. I have for my my 25th anniversary actually is tomorrow. Wow. And uh, you know, I'll be in northern Utah, so I'll be remote for that. But, uh, it, so I have a wide variety of things, but nearly every Thursday I talk about a religious book. A lot of times it's a non-LDS book, but or it's an LDS book. And I've been looking for this one for a long time. So when I finally was able to, to get a copy to take a look at, I was excited. I was able to take it with me on a trip to visit some family in Oklahoma, our children and grandchildren. And uh, it was so captivating. I took my time with it, and I'm still taking my time with it. And, and the rule of thumb that I have on my program, the more that I like a book, the longer it takes me to get through. <laughs> and this one has a lot of food for thought. But uh, just wanted to, to touch base with you and get a little background. You've been working on this one for a long time. Is, yeah. is it based on a, a thesis? By a, uh, by you. I, I do, mean, do is, you mean, is this something that you, you submitted to... Uh, a university somewhere. I mean, a lot of times yeah, we see that, yeah. and then and then they popularize it, or or they they do some light editing and then release it. That's typically what happens in biblical studies, anyway, for for most of these kind of projects. Yeah, it overlaps with my master's thesis. I did a master's thesis. I did a, a bachelor's in history at BYU and a master's at Utah State. I worked there with Philip Barlow, mm-hmm. who's an excellent religious studies scholar, and. Yeah, um, actually, I got uh, high praise on the thesis. Um, my committee chair said that he wished they could give me a doctorate for it because it was really a dissertation. I was pleased to hear that. And it, um, the thesis actually covers a couple different topics, one of which I pursue in this book, and that's the contents of the Lost Pages. And then it also talked, it t- tried to contextualize uh how that book was received, how that work was received in the early 1800s. Okay. So anyway, this is the one that's popularly available now. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I even talked about it on my program last week down oh. in St. George. I, I've recommended people try and track it down and get it for Christmas because uh, there is a lot of good material in it. And Kevin, I, you're in the acknowledgments. What was your first uh, acquaintance with this book? Oh, it's uh, many years ago. I just got an email out of the blue from Don, and he had some questions about my approach to Josiah. And, and uh, so I'm just, you know, one of many who, you know, maybe inherited one footnote or two. So I didn't have a real significant influence, but I have been watching for it ever since because uh, I've been interested in Don's story and in his work for a long time. You're one of the interlocutors whom I'm most eager to talk with about what's in there because. You know, I've got a certain area of expertise. Um, I am interested in things like 
biblical studies and the work of Margaret Barker. And I know that what I'm finding there from the, the internal evidence of the Book of Mormon in the early 19th century sources would interplay a lot with those aspects of biblical studies and particularly Margaret's work. But I'm not in a good position to see all the points of connection and you are. <laughs> well, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why scholarship is an ongoing discussion. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's not like somebody writes a book and we're done. It's just it's uh, the discussion goes on and we right. we uh, uncover something and then cast light and we all get you know if, if we're lucky people get excited and come and want to talk more and develop it more and then we open new doors that we find because of that. Yeah, and we'll we'll be talking on that throughout the night. But Don, why don't you just take a couple of minutes and outline the book for us? You you've got a few parts in it. And then you just kind of break it into the chronological, the, the way the book is lined out so that people kind of know what it is. And then we'll talk about sure. what brought you to the idea, what brought you to write the book. Sure. And then we'll talk about some of the specific findings. Great. So the book is in two parts. And I like to say that part one is the history of the lost pages. And part two is the history in the lost pages. So to, to break down what that means. So the first part tells, retells in, a, in an unfamiliar way the familiar story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and it um, adds a great deal of detail um, about the translation of the lost pages, you know, how, what was the process used, what were the in, translation instruments used, who were the scribes, uh, there's a lot that we can learn there. We can, you know, for instance, Emma was the first scribe on the Lost Pages. She she gives us information that identifies that for us, and therefore she's the first scribe for the whole Book of Mormon. It's at the beginning. It's Joseph and Emma, husband and wife, working to translate and transcribe this text. Um, there are things that we can figure out, like, um, you know, why was Martin Harris so persistent in trying to get that manuscript, right? Like, why would he pester God over and over, right? Well, no, no source actually spells that out for us, like says, oh, here's why Martin did it. But we can line up the evidence with the chronology of what happened, and then we can see why. So Joseph tells us when Martin was there taking dictation, mid-April, mid-June. If you look at the planting season, in upstate New York, where Martin was a prosperous farmer, it runs that exact time period. So he missed his whole planting season. Martin's daughter got married on May 8th, so right in the middle of that period. Guess who wasn't there for his own daughter's yeah, wedding? He missed it. He missed it. So he could not go home empty-handed, and he knew it. His family would not be satisfied if he said, oh, but if you could only see this manuscript, you would understand, right? He had to have something to show for his effort. Talk about the theft. Uh, got 40 some odd sources on that. I uh, look at was it Lucy Harris and did she burn it? And I critique the case for that actually. Lay out new suspects and what might have happened there. Part two, the history of the lost pages or the, I mean, in the lost pages, the missing stories. It turns out there's a great deal of evidence for these. There's evidence in the Book of Mormon text that we have. Small plates covers the same time period, so it gives a thumbnail sketch of that history. We can take that skeletal history provided by the small plates and we can add flesh to those bones by using the later part of Mormon's abridgment where he sometimes gives flashbacks to early events, mentions uh, that were in the lost pages, mentions Amenadi, mentions um, the children of Nephi fleeing from the land and so on. Um, we've got sources from the early revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants. We've got um, an interview that Justice Smith Sr. did, an extensive interview in 1830, the gold mine, where he tells some of the missing stories. We got a little bit from Joseph Smith directly, reported by a couple of the apostles. We've got a source from uh, Martin Harris's brother, Emer Harris, who was a direct ancestor of Dallin Harris Oaks, is what the H stands for. He told some of, about the manuscript and what was in it about the Mulekite. So there are all these puzzle pieces and even though we're missing most of the puzzle pieces, we've got enough that we can piece together that we can start to get a picture of what was in those lost pages. I mean, yeah. When I first heard about this project, frankly, I was like, <laughs> skeptical would be an understatement. 
And uh, I don't know about you, Kevin, but uh, <laughs> it, you know, Don's just laughing now. But uh, I am uh, in reading the book. I am surprised at how much I find. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it, it's been put together in such a way that you can see that, especially especially the uh, interview that Joseph Senior gave. Yeah, and that um, I, I think this. The the main access to that is in one of Dan Vogel's books, right? Uh, Does he have that in one of yeah, the... Yeah, that's... Is it volume four? That's a very accessible way of getting it. It's also just on the Internet. And uh, it's been... It's been a, it's a source that's been around for a while. It's certainly been known. It hasn't been very much used. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems to be what a lot of what you've got in this is, is that things have been out there. Yes. It's, it's kind of like I was talking to somebody about uh, the seer stone, the use of the seer stone to yeah. translate the Book of Mormon. And David Whipper mentioned that back in the 1880s. Yeah. But for some reason, it's been majorly overlooked by yeah. a lot of people until yeah, yeah, recently. Yeah. So it's it's more that, that kind of thing, and there's lots of that that goes into this book. So yeah. where did this book germinate? How long ago? Because <laughs> you've been working on it a while. I've been yeah. hearing about it for a long time. Yeah. And Kevin's been looking forward to it for a long time. So, you know, tell us a little of the backstory, if you would. The, the earliest motivation for the book goes back to primary for me. Um, Ten years old, uh, the, the South Bend, Indiana Ward, and uh, I was a Blazer A, and our teacher taught us about the presence of the church. It started with Joseph Smith, right? Told us the story of Joseph and Martin in the manuscript. And I just remember thinking, we're missing part of the Book of Mormon? Like, what, what was in it? You know, the Book of Mormon, it's so foundational to faith. You're a Latter-day Saint, and you grow up with, it's this, you know, ubiquitous presence. It's everywhere. And the idea that we're missing a huge part of it, and nobody really would talk about what was in it, nobody knew was kind of baffling so later in my adult life about 15 years ago i started to realize that the since the lost pages were the first part of mormon's abridgment joseph smith tells us that um if we want to understand the part of mormon's abridgment that we have we really need a pretty good idea of what was in that first part right Suppose you were reading a novel, a giant novel, War and Peace, right? And somebody just comes and rips out the first half, and then somebody gives you like a thumbnail sketch of some of that first half, and then you're supposed to fully understand the second half. That would be a pretty tall order. So the, the reason really that I started the project, I'd always been interested in what was in the lost pages of the Book of Mormon, but I really started the project to try to understand what was in the existing present pages of the Book of Mormon. And what I found is, indeed, knowing from the sources what was in those lost pages, some of what was in there helps tremendously to understand what we have already. So when you started this, were you, were you part of the church then or not? Because I, I don't know how many of our listeners know your story, just in a distilled way. But just, just give us a little background on that and, and kind of where this book fits in that chronology. I know you talked sure. about it a little bit. Yeah, the book, yeah. But just very brief. Yeah. So I grew up very devoutly Latter-day Saint. Um, it, I started doing church history research at the church archives at 17. I'd go there after school, <laughs> uh, all through the school year. Um, I was an unusual kid. But um, I, I started over time, I just continued this research for a long time in my early adult life, and there were a lot of things that I was finding. I was making new discoveries, but they were difficult to square sometimes with the narrative as I had been given it. And so I kind of uh, gradually, even without knowing it even at first, was kind of losing my faith. And... Um, at the time that I started looking into the Book of Mormon's lost pages, I was still in the church. I was definitely in a, a questioning place. Um, it was a little while after that that really, um, you know, I just became so disillusioned that I ended up actually leaving 
the church. I felt that I didn't belong, that I had nothing that I could contribute. And so I hand-delivered to my bishop a letter resigning my membership from the church. I was out of the church officially for five years. At the time that I left, I was an atheist, um, mostly because of the problem of suffering. I couldn't square that with a loving God at the time. And um, I just I had a very involved, <laughs> uh, intense journey where gradually I came to believe first that, that religion was a good thing, even though I didn't think it was strictly accurate. Then I came to believe in God. You know, there's various the whole story for each of these things. I came to be reconverted to Jesus Christ. And then the biggest shocker to me was when I was doing research actually on the the first vision and related research on the lost 116 pages and narratives in the lost pages that Justice Smith Sr. tells us about the Nephite interpreters or the Nephites acquiring interpreters, the Nephite prophet becoming a seer, which is similar to Justice Smith becoming a seer with the first vision. And I found things in that research that just blew me away. I, um, because they had so many implications about Joseph Smith's sincerity, about the power of what he was teaching, and they they flouted my expectations that I thought Nauvoo Endowment, Joseph Smith didn't know anything about it until he became a Freemason on March 17, 1842. And what I actually found is that there's Nauvoo Endowment in the story of the brother of Jared in Ether 3, that was translated 1829. There's Nauvoo Endowment material absolutely in what we're told about what was in the Lost Pages, 1828. And there's, quote-unquote, Nauvoo Endowment material in the first vision at the very beginning of 1820. So literally from day one, Joseph Smith already has the structure of the endowment in his mind. It has so many implications. And it, it started, it, that wasn't, of course, the whole story, but it initiated the process of me reconsidering my life's experience and realizing where I needed to be. And I... I so you've had experiences church. before. We we talked yeah. a little bit, and and yet you'd you'd kind of forgotten, or you had a different well, interpretation about. I hadn't forgotten. So I'd had. Sometimes there's an assumption that when people leave the church, they uh, have either haven't had spiritual experiences, or that they are just sort of like purposely flouting their their spiritual experiences. I had had spiritual experiences, and ones that were really meaningful to me. What happened is that I came to question whether those were actually from outside of me, from God, or whether they were just from inside of me. So I thought these experiences may be important, but they're maybe more psychologically important than epistemologically important. They don't tell me about the universe. They just tell me something about me and what appeals to me and what I find inspiring. And so that that was how I saw those experiences during that time. But this research brought you back to Joseph Smith. Yes. And and in a way that was, uh, no, he didn't make this up. Right. But it's a lot different than what your original understanding of it was. So, so in other words, yeah. there's a, there's a new, yeah. it's much more, it's much different. And, and you talk about this in the book. You, yeah. you portray this as being a lot more complex is, yeah. is a good word, I think, yeah. than what we really realize. Yeah. And and so we we tend to picture it in our minds in a very straightforward fashion. Yes. And, and it was not quite as straightforward as that. But that doesn't change the reality of the first vision or right. Moroni's visit or the translation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was an ex-Mormon, self-identified ex-Mormon for five years before I was rebaptized. And I was very active in the ex-Mormon community. I went a couple times to the ex-Mormon conference. I went to a lot of ex-Mormon social events. And um, I would hear things from fellow ex-Mormons where they would say a lot, well, you, you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? Like once you lose your faith, once it cracks, once it falls apart, there's no going back. And... Um, you know, in one sense, I agree with that. I think if you, I, so in my case, I've literally spent tens of thousands of hours studying Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and the early history of the Restoration. 
there's no way that I'm going to see those things exactly the way that I did before all that research. If, if you spend tens of thousands of hours studying anything and you come out seeing it the exact same way you did before, you're doing it wrong, right? So, so I, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so um, it's not that uh, Humpty Dumpty gets put back together again. It's there were these fragments, right, of my faith, and they fit together in a new way. They fit together into something bigger, right? That, um, and so in my understanding now, there's still a first vision. There's still Moroni, right? There's still the translation of the Book of Mormon. There's still John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John. All these things happened, but sometimes the chronology, uh, the meaning of the events, the scope of the events, sometimes the events, so much more actually happened in those events. It was so much more complex, and the meaning is so much bigger or different than what we thought. So it fits together. It just doesn't fit together the way that I had originally thought. And if I were to insist to myself, it has to fit together the way I originally thought, or I can't believe, I would have to not believe. But why insist on that? Yeah, because... You've grown and you've learned a lot more about yeah. it, and it's it's much stronger than it was. Before. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you you talk in the book about some of these complexities, and one of the things that struck me right at, out of the gate, yeah, was how much Joseph's recovery of the Book of Mormon and his translation of the Book of Mormon was tied in with ancient Jewish festivals. Yeah. Now, my yeah. wife and I w ran across the article about the Feast of the Tabernacles that uh, was done in Trumpets, Anson, yeah. the Trump Feast of the Trumpets. That's right. In in a, a farm's publication. I think it was Journal of Book of Mormon Studies early on. I think so. It was Lynn yeah. Hadley Reed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then she redid that in the Ensign. And yet you've got several more. Yeah. Tell us about a few of those. So I, I had been aware of Lynette Hadley Reed's work. So basically what she's showing is if you look at the chronology of Joseph recovering the plates, you know, his first visit to the hill is September 22nd, 1823. He goes back over the course of four years on the same day. It's the fall equinox. So he goes back the last time on September 22nd, 1827. And in the Jewish calendar, uh, feast days, festivals don't happen on the same day in our calendar because it's on a lunar calendar. So it, it, those calendars vary how they relate from year to year. So that particular year, 1827, the Feast of Trumpets, which celebrates the giving of the law, and it's Rosh Hashanah, it's the Jewish, it's one of the two Jewish New Year's, um, that is the day that Joseph Smith gets the golden plates. And what I have discovered in my research, and is in some of these early chapters in part one, is we haven't looked closely enough before at the early sources and the chronology that they give us. One of Joseph Smith's neighbors uh, in the Chase family, who knew quite a bit from Joseph Sr. about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, says that Joseph went to the hill that first day, so this would be Feast of Trumpets, and he says 10 days later, Joseph goes back. So Joseph actually, Lucy Mac Smith tells us some of this too, Joseph got the plates, but he didn't bring them home. He brings home the interpreters, he brings home the breastplate, he takes the plates and he hides them in a hollowed out tree or log. Um, he goes back, according to the neighbor, 10 days later to get those plates and bring them home and reunite the interpreters with the plates, right? The, the translation instrument with what it's going to translate. So if you look at the Jewish calendar and you go 10 days into the new year, these 10 days are known as the days of awe or days of repentance. And they take you to the first day. Well, they, they take you to the day of atonement, which is the most significant sacrificial date in the Jewish calendar. Sacrifices are made for all of Israel's sins, you know, obviously prefiguring Christ. Yeah. And the high priest goes into the temple. High priest goes into the Holy of Holies, the Holy wearing of Holies the breastplate, yes. wearing the Urim and Thummim, yes. equivalent to the interpreters, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. He goes to the Ark, which is, um, the Ark is it a... It contains a, the relics. A, it's a gold box that mm -hmm. has within it stone tablets. So Joseph Smith goes to the hill, yeah, and he finds a stone box in which are gold tablets, 
Yes. <laughs> and uh, just the, the inverse, right, of the biblical pattern there. So this isn't where the chronology doesn't end here, not at all. So Lucy Max Smith tells the, a conference of the church years later that uh, in 1845, on uh, October, I just had it, October 8th, I believe it was, uh, 1845, she says that 18 years earlier on that day, Joseph looked into those interpreters that he brought home to find out who should help him in this work. He looks in the interpreters and he sees Martin Harris and he asks his mother to go get Martin Harris and have him come visit the Smiths. Now, this is the third event now in the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. From Joseph, you know, Joseph gets the plates, then he brings the plates home. Now the third event is he, look, he actually uses the interpreters and sees who's supposed to help him. Mm-hmm. So the four, 14 days into the Jewish New Year, on the, the 15th, you know, two, two weeks from the Jewish New Year, on the 15th day of the month, well, the Bible says what's supposed to happen on that day. It's another festival. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, which commemorates the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And that's the day that Joseph sends for Martin Harris to tell him he's supposed to take characters from the plates and take his own journey back east. And the Jewish festival season ends there. There's there's these these three, you know, fall festivals right together. Then it ends... And Until yet, spring. right. And yet, this chronology of links between the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the Jewish calendar doesn't end there. Yeah. Because Martin tells us that on um, that that weeks later, you know, there there are all these efforts to steal the plates, right? Raids on the Smith property, tearing up the floorboards, you know, attacking the Cooper shop, the, you know, so on, raiding the house, even. <laughs> Um, the um, Smiths are, are trying to protect these plates. It's this period of trial, this period of struggle, right? They're sort of being tested here. They determine that they're going to go down and live by Emma's family down in Harmony. And so they set a date to leave, and the date is Monday, November 3rd, but that's a decoy date. They're giving out that date because they're actually going to leave earlier, but they don't want their enemies to know it. And so the day they actually leave, Martin tells us, is Saturday, November 1st. Well, if you look at that starting day that Joseph got the plates, September 22nd, 1827, Feast of Trumpets, beginning of Trumpets, 40 days from there is November 1st. So just like in the the 40 days, of course, this is a significant thing in the Bible. This is how long Moses is up on Sinai, right, getting the law. Mm -hmm. Oh, Actually, I think I just made another connection. So, Feast of Trumpets celebrates the getting of the law. Moses goes up on the mount for 40 days to get the law. 40 days from Trumpets is November 1st. So, that goes in the second edition of the book. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's an announcement right there. We'll, we'll get back to that later. So, anyway, there, yeah. there's a lot of this. Briefly, yeah. just tell us about the... Uh, the way the Passover fits into that, and then we'll jump into the contents of 160 days. Okay. So, so Passover really fits in two ways. Do you want me to go into both of those? Uh, or Just a just, couple just, sentences. And okay. Then I, I think we might okay. even be able to get a caller. So okay, great. Somebody's so, been on hold for a little while. So Passover fits in one way because that actually, from Joseph's chronology that he gives in his history of the translation of the Lost Pages, it actually appears, we don't have a definite date, but it appears that that may have begun at Passover. And then something we maybe could talk about uh, later, would certainly fit second hour, um, would be uh, that there's evidence from Joseph Smith Sr. and from the Book of Mormon text that the Book of Mormon itself, its own narrative, begins at Passover. Yeah, well, and that's something that you published. Yes, an that's an interpreter. So for our listeners yeah. who subscribe. They've already had a chance to look at that. And if you haven't, uh, you can it's, just go back a couple of weeks ago. It's called a Passover right setting mm-hmm. for Lehi's Exodus. Yes, yes. Anyway, we've, we've got this, these, uh, the contents, and you yeah. talk about it right up front where you have the Passover setting and you have the, uh, the setting of Josiah. 
Yeah. And that's what you wanted to, to talk with Kevin about. So why don't we take yeah. a couple of minutes to do that, and then we will talk about some of the other contents in the book, and then the last five minutes before the top of the hour we'll summarize your conclusions. There's there's several things in there, a yeah. lot of which I've always believed about the book more, but you codify it and uh, break it down, and it, and it tracks with what your research has shown yes. in, a, in a way that's that's been really impressive to me. So. Uh, go ahead and, and talk with Kevin a little bit about your Josiah theory. And then we'll talk more about that, of course, in the next hour, because we will be doing that. So Josiah relates in a couple ways to the Book of Mormon. So first, uh, King Josiah was, is I, I believe he's Zedekiah's father. And yes. so the, the king who becomes king right before Lehi's calling is Josiah's son. So the Josiah reform has been going on, is going on, still at this time, it continues. And so the Josiah reform is one of the crucial settings in which we should place Lehi, that this is part of Lehi's Jerusalem, this is going on around Lehi. Lehi may be, is, is Lehi following along with the Josiah reform? Is Lehi reacting against the Josiah reform? These are, these are questions that come up, and I, I think the relationships there are actually quite complex. I see wording sometimes in the Book of Mormon and in the early Doctrine and Covenants revelations that echo wording about Josiah and his reform from the Bible. At the same time, and, and actually Hugh Nibley suggested that the name Mosiah evokes Moses and Josiah and uh, certainly Mosiah seems to be a figure who echoes both of these he's a Moses, he leads an exodus he's also the leader of a sort of reformation was Mosiah's this, this reform is the first Mosiah, this is Mosiah not, the first not the, not the more familiar Mosiah this is the first Mosiah whose full story was in the lost page this is King Benjamin's dad it turns out to be really a crucial figure that we have so little about in right. our book. And, and we won't have time to develop it, but it's in chapter, I believe it's 14. 14. Yeah. That chapter is your book. the crescendo for me of this book. <laughs> That's the stuff I love the most, <laughs> really. Um, and as I see it, the Mosaian reform, as I'm calling it, it in some ways echoes the Josiah reform. It's certainly against idolatry. Um, I think that, and certainly for keeping the commandments of God, it seems to me that the Mosaian reform mostly echoes the form of the Josiah reform more than its contents. In some ways, it seems to even be a kind of counter Josiah reform because the Josiah reform ends up being so focused on the law, focused on a book, whereas the Mosaian reform, based on the information we can piece together, particularly the the Joseph Smith Sr. narrative about the interpreters, the Mosaian reform does not seem to focus primarily on a book. It focuses instead on the means of revelation, the means by which such books of Scripture are revealed, the interpreter and the Spirit of the Lord. And so um, there's a complex relationship, is what I'm seeing, between Mosiah and the Book of Mormon and the Josiah reform. So, Kevin, response. Yeah, that's, you know, I'd never even heard of Josiah uh, growing up in the church, and yet he was Zedekiah's father. I don't think I'd ever had a Sunday school lesson about him, and I, I didn't really even think about Josiah until I read a book by Richard Elliott Friedman called Who Wrote the Bible? Yeah. And it's a, you know, popular popular survey of the documentary Hypothesis. That's, by and the way, uh, he makes the case. Kevin, this story is, is something that you put on Interpreter back in 2013. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I'm, I not, did, uh, I'm, I'm just telling I've, our listeners where they can go to look that up. Yeah, the, I've, I've, I've written on this. I've been writing on this uh, stuff, actually. It turns out now for about 20 years, because it, it was a bit longer than that You know, when I read uh, Friedman's book, and I've read several others. But the idea that, that uh, this period of time was crucial for the formation of the Bible as we have it, and that there's uh, you know a key part of, of uh, what Josiah did. He, his father was named Ammon, and he was assassinated. And then it says that the people of the land killed the people that killed 
uh, Ammon, and then they made Josiah king when he's eight years old. And then when Josiah is 20 years old, <clears throat> there's two different accounts. There's one account where they find the book in the temple, and he launches the reform because of not keeping the commandments. And there's a different version in Chronicles where he starts the reform, and as part of the reform, they find a book. So there's a, a little bit different accounts than what we have. And uh, But the idea is Lehi would have grown up during the reform. He would have seen it. And then when Josiah was unexpectedly killed uh, uh, by the Egyptians, then one of Josiah's sons is installed as king. This is uh, Jehoiakim, is installed as king for 11 years. So uh, Nephi and uh, Laman and Lemuel and Sam would have been growing up, you know, coming up to, to you know, teenagers and manhood, basically, during this period of time. And then when uh, the Babylonians come and they... They uh, take joy came off and they kill him, and then they install Zedekiah as king. So now, they've, instead of having an Egyptian government, basically they've got you know the Babylonians. And then this is this is when Lehi is called. And so Lehi is called, yeah. and what happens in the very first chapter of the Book of Mormon? I guess we get this into the next half. I think for me it sets up the most interesting tensions in relationships with uh, the design reform because. Uh, you know, Jeremiah and Lehi, they both know Deuteronomy, you know, which is, the, you know, at least a version of Deuteronomy was the book that was found in relationship to, to Isaiah's reform. But there are certain key elements of the reform that uh, Lehi's the first chapter of the Book of Mormon directly takes on. You know, that he, that Lehi, uh, you know, is concerned about what's going on in Jerusalem, and he and he sees the you know, the pillar of fire, and then he goes home and lays on his bed, and then he has the vision of the great, the great council and, the, and the, you know, the one, well, it's the you know, throne. like him to the, sees, he's yeah, the, he the, sees the throne, throne vision. And that's mm-hmm. specifically something yeah. that Deuteronomy says, you yeah. can't see the Lord, you can only hear his voice. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, when he goes and gives his first public discourse, he says there's going to be a Messiah, and there's going to be the redemption of the world. It turns out that uh, the sacred calendar in Deuteronomy 16 <laughs> doesn't have the Day of Atonement. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've just changed the priesthood so that the priest, the high priest is no longer anointed. That is literally no longer a Messiah. And so I think that's why he gets in trouble is because he's, he's objecting to some of the things that they've done. And uh, so it's it becomes real interesting, but it's, you know, for me it, it's... It's this aspect of the whole situation that we just never thought about uh, up until uh, <laughs> about 20 years ago when you know LDS, a few LDS scholars started reading uh, The Great Angel. And it's gotten really interesting since then. You know, and there's some back and forth. I had a back and forth with Bill Hamlin, actually, uh, about five or six years ago, mm-hmm. an interpreter. So when we, when we um, talk about Lehi and Nephi leaving, I, I think the premise is that they're beginning they're beginning two things. It, it, and uh, Don, I think this is what what you say in your book. Mm-hmm. They're beginning an exile. Yes. Okay. Because this is the first of when the Babylon takes over, exactly. Zedekiah is put yes. on the throne. And, and Kevin, you can kind of monitor this for us too. And the second is they're going on about their own exodus. Exactly. Now, years and years yes. ago, yes. there was an article in BYU Studies about the Exodus theme in the Book of Mormon yeah. and yeah. how often that yeah. is, and, and yeah. Hugh Nibley referenced it a lot in yeah. his writings. There have been several things. Now yeah, I mean, yeah. You, yeah, because you, yeah. Have, you have Lehi leaving, then you have Nephi leaving, then you have Mosiah the first leaving, then you have Zenith leaving, then you have Alma returning. I mean, there's just constantly, when things get heavy, people leave and yeah. go into the wilderness in order to maintain their purity. But and it, that gets, also, it carries on even further. Yeah, it carries on even further because then we have the, the saints leaving it and going out to Utah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have the exile and the diaspora of the Jews. I, I yeah. hope I'm pronouncing yes. that correctly. But where they're being spread all around the world because right. the temple is destroyed. The first temple is destroyed. And when we build the second temple, that's significantly different. That's one of the main arguments, if I understand her correctly, of Margaret Barker, right, Kevin? Yes. And, yeah. and it There's is a difference missing between first and second yes, temple. Yes, it is missing some elements. In right. fact, 
Bill Frank, Hamlin Frank. wrote a uh, wrote. Did he gave a paper at her Temple Studies group a few years back uh, about Temple? I, was it in John? I think you remember Kevin. Yeah. And uh, uh, yes. And yeah. So this is where if John in his book basically jumps off the cliff, some might say, <laughs> but <laughs> but literally. It's from that starting point that you build your narrative. Yes, and absolutely. And in the narrative, we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left to yeah. summarize, and then the next portion we'll, we'll take it up a little more with the Come Follow Me section. But um, in your conclusions, there, there, are several, uh, there are several conclusions that you come to in the book. Let me just summarize those really quick. Number sure. one, the Book of Mormon is a Jewish book. In, in, in just a sentence, what do you mean by that? The the themes are very Judaic from the start. It actually starts out at the very beginning of the Jewish exile and really responds to the themes of exile, the losses of all the institutions of the Jewish commonwealth, where the Lehi and Nephi systematically attempt to replace all of those things. They replace the old promise line with the new Solomon's temple, with Nephi's temple, and so on. So... In other words, the, there's a theme out there that the Book of Mormon is very Christian restoration. Right. And, and yet you found it was more Jewish. Especially what we can know about the Lost Pages. It's, so the Book of Mormon has been called Christian Primitivist because it has things about restoring the New Testament church. The Book of Mormon, and particularly the Lost Pages, are just as much what we could call Judaic Primitivist. They're not only trying to restore the New Testament church, they're trying to restore the institution, they're trying to restore ancient Israel. And then the second major theme, and, and there are about eight or seven or eight, yeah. and I think we're only going to have time for two, is temple. Uh, one of the things that struck me all the way through was how much temple symbolism, temple uh, likenesses, temple similarities and, and even practices mm -hmm. are in the res restoration of the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. the translation of the Book of mm -hmm. Mormon, Absolutely. The, the interpreters as Absolutely. you kind of portray mm -hmm. them and describe them in the book. And uh, so that's another one. How much of that? So all I can tell people is you've really got to pick this book up and look at it for yourself. As I said, when I first heard about this project, I was extremely skeptical. And I'm not going to say it's going to supplant my reading of the Book of Mormon, but what I will say is it opens up for me a, and anybody who reads it, a lot of new ways to think about Joseph and those events and the Book of Mormon itself. So once again, we want to thank Don Bradley for being with us the first hour. Don has graciously agreed to be with us for our second hour with Come Follow Me. And so right after this news break, we'll be right back for the second hour of Interpreter Foundation Radio. This is Terry Hutchinson with Don Bradley and Kevin Christensen. Thank you. Please stay tuned. Now, The Interpreter Show, with discussion, debate, and the latest information on all kinds of religious issues and topics. Good evening, everyone. Terry Hutchinson sitting in with Kevin Christensen, my co-host. We'd like to excuse John Gee tonight, who's uh, taking care of some family business. And we've got a special guest, Don Bradley, with us this evening. Good evening, Don. Welcome Hello. back for our second hour. Thank you. And Kevin, welcome back. Yes. So Here again. Yes. <laughs> so the second hour, as you know, we do a, uh, a presentation about our Come Follow Me assignment. And we're a couple of weeks ahead of where the regular church is. So this morning in church, we talked about the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation. And actually, there was something in there that ties in with what we're going to be talking about today, which will be 1 Nephi 1 through 7. And uh, I really want to thank Bruce Webster and Chris Fredrickson and, and their group for trading with us, because normally we're on the second Sunday instead of the third. So because John had a presentation in Europe and I, my daughter was going into the MTC this week, uh, they graciously agreed to switch us. And because of that, we get this fantastic 
topic to talk about tonight. But before we get to that, we just want to thank our sponsor, CruiseLady.com. For, so if you like Latter-day Saint cruises on Latter-day Saint topics, we'd encourage you to check out Cruise Lady. They invite you to explore the world with a Latter-day Saint scholar. So, for example, in April, you can join interpreter radio host and KSL radio host Martin Tanner on a Book of Mormon cruise. That'll be in April of this coming year. Uh, you can sail through the Panama Canal. You'll be able to see Mexico, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Colombia. You'll hear up-to-date Book of Mormon evidences and scholars. Now, you can go with Professor Jack Welch on a tour of Germany in June of 2020. You can see where he discovered chiasmus in the Book of Mormon while he was on his mission. And you'll have the rare opportunity to see the world-famous passion play of Obergammerau. In fact, in, in 1633, it's been going on every 10 years ever since. So the residents of Oberammergau, Germany, vowed that if God spared them from the bubonic plague every 10 years, they'd produce a play depicting the last days and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, the villagers were spared from death, and so they put that play on every time. My grandparents went to that back in the 1970s. And then finally, you can join Interpreter Foundation President Dan Peterson in July of 2020 on a cruise that will include a visit to uh, St. Petersburg, You'll go to Finland, Sweden, Berlin, Estonia, and Copenhagen. I've had several friends from down in St. George go on that cruise, and they love it. They say St. Petersburg is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. So check out that out. For more information, you can go to cruiselady.com, or you can call them at 801-453-9444. That's cruiselady.com, and once again, call 801-453-9444. So... We're going to be talking about First Nephi 1 through 7. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of ways to approach this. And one of the things I'd like to do, and we, we talked about this earlier, is to uh, ask each one of you to talk about uh, a couple of books or articles about cover, kind of covering this reading section right here that have impressed you over the years. It doesn't have to be anything recent. For example, one of the things that uh, that always struck me early on, the minute I first saw it, and I've been looking for it in the scriptures ever since, including uh, what we had in Revelations today, was Blake Osler's article called The Throne Theophany, about the throne theophany, about Lehi's, Lehi's vision. And we're going to be talking about that in greater detail here in a couple of minutes. But there was that one, and there's several others. Kevin, what are a couple of the things that, uh, that have really... Uh, impressed you and changed the way you've you've read the Book of Mormon over the years with regard to just this section? I mean, there's obviously when... Okay. You know, okay, with, with just this section, I think there's there's an essay by uh, Ben McGuire that was published in, during the Book of Mormon studies called Nephi and Goliath, a case study of literary illusion in the Book of Mormon, <laughs> and another article by uh, Alan Goff about quotes beginning from repetitions. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you, you, just got... told, you just told two of Don's, so there we go. We figured that <laughs> okay. would be it. You guys, great well, minds to the <laughs> Yeah, but uh, um, if, if you read, if you, when you read Don's book and if you read these articles, you'll see that they're using a very similar techniques for paying close attention to illusion, and that's just helping instead of just reading the surface story to see how there will be lots of uh, verbal cues that are pointing back to other stories in the Bible, and the... The, the idea is you're supposed to see it in stereo, to have it kind of carry on a dialogue with this other story at the same time. And there will be similarities that come forth, and there will be variations. And, and they're both trying, you know, they're supposed to be there. Um, also, there's, uh, well, there's, <laughs> you know, at least uh, the high in the desert, that was good. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, for me, of course, the thing that has made the biggest difference in my reading of the Book of Mormon was when I ran across the work of Margaret Barker. And if, if a person says a bit of a nibblerophile, then the place to start with her is a book called The Great Angel, The Study of Israel's Second God. Uh, but if you don't have a real, uh, you know, if you haven't been doing this for a while, there's a little book called Temple Theology and Introduction. And it's just 100 pages where she just kind of lays out this basic approach that, that she's taking. And it's the idea of, her, it's her take on that the first temple, that what we know is Christianity it's really rooted in the first temple, and that uh, what Jesus was doing is, was uh, restoring the original religion of the first temple. 
and that there was a violent overthrow of the temple priesthood that took place in Lehi's lifetime that he saw and was responding to. And so for me, when, when I ran across this stuff, um, you know, I, I, I read two reviews in the Farms Review books that quoted the same passage from the great angel, so it stuck in my head. And then sometimes, you know, I'd never seen a copy of her books anywhere in, in bookstores. And uh, my you know, visiting my brother in Dallas took me to a huge half-price books in Dallas that he said was his favorite bookstore. So I'm wandering around there on the second floor, and I see, a, you know, there was a group, Great Angel by Margaret Barker, and I saw that and I remembered it. Pulled it down from the shelf, and took it home, and I was halfway through it, and I called my brother back, and I said, go back to that store and buy it, every other copy of this book. Yeah, they're hard to find. Uh, they're hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I bought up every copy of that. Well, now they're easy to find, you know, because, you know, since, uh, actually, since uh, my book came out, all of her books have come back into print, and I suspect that has something to do with it. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. We are all great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Don, what are a couple of yours now that Kevin's kind of yeah, stolen a couple so, of them? Well, so give us a couple yeah. more, and then I'll get the hard part and I, try and make I would definitely up. reinforce those. So Nephi and Goliath, which is, of course, playing on David and Goliath, um, is is fascinating and very helpful in understanding, particularly this part of the Book of Mormon. Um, Alan Goff has additional essays, and I'm not actually r- recalling the names. I believe that they were mostly in the Farms Review of Books. Um, he kind of combines reviewing books and laying out um, some philosophical sort of backdrop for interpretation with really close, detailed analysis of intertextuality in the Book of Mormon, where the Book of Mormon narratives are written in a style where you are supposed to see a sort of typology. You're supposed to think of certain biblical narratives, and that's really part of the meaning of what you are reading. And if you don't get the biblical connections, you're not getting the full freight of meaning that's carried there. It's crucial to understanding this part of the Book of Mormon, and in fact, the whole Book of Mormon. That is actually a point you bring up in your in in the conclusion of your book is that yeah, the Book of right. Mormon is really tied in more with the Bible, and, so and they deserve biblical. to be they deserve to be so read biblical. together. It's very yeah. important. To read in in some ways, sometimes, as I say in that conclusion, sometimes the Book of Mormon even seems. It does so much with the Bible and takes the Bible, biblical narrative, so much further in the direction it was already going. But sometimes the Book of Mormon seems more biblical than the Bible, so to speak, right? Or a better way of putting it, maybe, is the Book of Mormon helps the Bible to be more biblical. It yeah. brings yeah. out more of these themes. It makes them more visible to the reader. It's certainly done yeah. that for me. So uh, one thing that I would mention, and we mentioned it last hour would be, I mean, I happen to have recently published something that deals with this exact time period in the Book of Mormon, these exact chapters, and that's that interpreter piece, a Passover setting for Lehi's Exodus. Yeah, yeah. That's that's sort of a lot of that's my take on this That's a springboard to, yeah. uh, to a lot of that. And then I would just add to what you both you and Kevin have said, and, and Kevin's occasional papers really yeah, yes. got me into yes. Margaret Barker and... and uh, it changed the way I read the scripture. There's there's a few people that do that. So I would just mention uh, one of them is Glimpses of yeah. Lake High's Jerusalem, yeah. collection of essays. Kevin's got an essay in there that was tied in with something that Margaret Barker wrote called uh, Josiah about Josiah, what did King Josiah reform. Mm-hmm. And then Kevin kind of followed that up. So Margaret doesn't really, and, and she's claimed this a couple of times that she's written with Kevin, where she says, I'm going to talk about the biblical issues. Kevin's going to talk about their relationship to the Book of Mormon and Latter day Saint. Mm-hmm. For me, that has really helped me understand more of what's going on, especially with regard to the Book of Mormon being more Christian than a lot of people are, are you know, a lot of critics are comfortable with. And and if I could look at a copy of the Gold Plates, the only thing, the 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 number one thing I would want to see is the characters that are used whenever it says Jesus Christ in our English mm. translation. Mm. I would want to see what that character was. Yeah. But that, I mean, you know, so that's one of them. And then, then the other one is actually a book by a non-LDS scholar called Scott Hahn. And we'll talk about this a little later in this hour. But uh, he wrote a book 
about 10 years ago called Kinship by Covenant. It's part of the Anchor Yale Bible Reference Library. And it's about, it's a description of covenants all through the Bible and how there are different kinds of Middle Eastern covenants, what, they, what they're constituted of, how, how they're made, how they're signified, and then how they're used and referred to in the scriptures. And uh, that book set me on a path uh, of trying to understand covenants and temples and everything in the scriptures as well as the Messiah that, that really has opened up my eyes. And, and so I, I look for that. And, and on the title page of the Book of Mormon, it specifically says that um, one of the main purposes, there are two of them, and mm-hmm. one of them is to remind Israel of the great things that the Lord hath done for them, to remind them of the covenants that the Lord made with them. So it's, uh, those, those are just some, some books or, or resources that we'd suggest that people use when they go into this. So getting into it, uh, there's a couple of ways to, to approach this. One of them is to just go right to the manual that, that we all have either on our phone or in a Come Follow Me manual and just kind of track it. Or we can talk about the uh, the scriptures uh, in the reading assignment, and and I think we're we'd like I'd like to take that today because I have two men here who have deeply studied this early part of the Book of Mormon, particularly Lehi and Nephi, mm-hmm. and how they yeah. left Jerusalem and went forward. So, Kevin, um, I'm going to ask you to lead the conversation with chapter one here. Uh, you okay. uh, I, and, and time really flies. And and one of the things okay. I was going to mention for everybody before we start is that we're really blessed today because we get to talk about the section of Scripture that more Latter-day Saints have read more <laughs> often than any other period. End of story. I mean, nobody has read. I mean, First Nephi, what you'd have to say, has probably been read more often than any other book in the church ever. Would you say that, Kevin? Yes, I would say that. <laughs> yeah. So on a and so note, one yes. of the, yeah. So one of the things that uh, when I approach the scriptures, I don't just do it myself. You know, I like to go to. It, I like to stand on the shoulders of giants because then you can see farther. You know, rather than crouching down at the pygmies, you know, and then you're just looking at the grass. But uh, you know, get on the shoulders of giants, and it doesn't matter which one. Just find someone that that's you know, done some study, and then you eventually get to other sources. But uh, another book I could mention is Joe's, uh, Joe M. Spencer wrote a book called Another Testament on Typology. And so here's this passage that we've read more than anything else. Very first uh, verse of the Book of Mormon. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, and having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored to the Lord in all my days, and having a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God, therefore I make a proceeding of my days. And what Spencer notices is there's this overall pattern going on here where it's his own creation. He's born of goodly parents. There's a fall. He has many afflictions. There's an atonement. He's highly favored to the Lord. And there's the veil of the temple, a great knowledge of the mysteries of God. And then he points out that the overall structure of the books of First and Second Nephi have the same structure. There's a creation story where they're you know, getting to the new world, First Nephi 1 to 18. There's the fall where he separates from his, his brothers. Uh, there's the atonement where from First Second Nephi 6, is uh, he has Jacob deliver what turns out to be a Day of Atonement uh, discourse, all leading up to a veil at the end of Second Nephi, where he talks about uh, being able to sing with the tongues of angels, which he's not talking about the gift of tongues. He's talking about joining in the heavenly choirs like Lehi, you know, a number of concourses of angels. You know, so it's, a, the, again, creation, fall, atonement, veil. Well, the temple is there from the very, very start. And um, Nephi, or Lehi, is concerned about what's going on in Jerusalem, so he prays, and he, he sees a vision. He sees the, you know, the pillar of fire on the rock, and so this is reminiscent of what Moses reported. And he goes home and lays on his bed, and then he has the council vision where he sees you know, the heavenly council and, and uh, this association between you know, the, the Son of God and the stars and the twelve coming down after him. And then he uh, reads from the book, and he's worried about what's happening. And then when he goes out to to preach, he says there's going to be a Messiah and the redemption of the world, and that gets him into trouble. 
and this is where, you know, for me reading a bit about what was going on with Josiah's reform and with the, with the Deuteronomist, the social situation and the kind of tensions that were in Jerusalem, the thing about Josiah's reform is it was a um, violent overthrow of the temple priesthood. And so there was, you know, when Margaret spoke at BYU in 2003, the comment in her talk that most struck me and most changed my approach to it was she said, Josiah's changes concerned the uh, priests and were thus changes at the very heart of the temple. And the things, you know, two of the things that were changed, well, the kind of things that were changed were what Lehi even saw, that he saw the council vision. And the, the Deuteronomists were saying, no, you don't have, need to have those kind of visions. And that they changed the calendar so that uh, they didn't have the Day of Atonement anymore and they didn't have the, the high priest uh, being anointed. You know, the priests of the second temple were called the priests of the many colored robes. And the, the idea was that the oil had been lost with the first temple. So they were no longer anointed. And they didn't have the Day of Atonement, at least you know, at that period of time in that calendar. They were trying to, to suppress it. So when Lehi gets up to speak, the reason he gets into such serious trouble right away is because he's talking about what they have just violently suppressed. So I think it, it's extraordinary that the Book of Mormon takes us directly into this lost world it, uh, that uh, you know people didn't know about. You know, Margaret's first book came out in 1987. And it's called the Older Testament. And when I wrote my book, uh, Paradigms Regained, I quoted three times this uh, paragraph from the Older Testament. And I think I'll, I'll just read this and then I'll, I'll let it go. The life and works of Jesus were and should be interpreted in light of something other than Jerusalem Judaism. This other had its roots in the conflicts of the 6th century B.C., when the traditions of the monarchy were divided as an inheritance among several heirs. It would have been lost, but for the accidents of archaeological discovery, and the evidence of pre-Christian texts preserved and transmitted only by Christian hands. So all of this, this kind of thing sends shivers up my spine. Yeah. Well, her <laughs> second book goes to the Book of Enoch. And uh, yes. and that talks about some some Christian elements from that, and that really every one of her books subsequently builds upon the prior book. When when you talk oh, yes. about and, that, and uh, when she read the Book of Mormon, actually she she read uh, she'd come to BYU and she talked about Josiah, and she you know she'd seen this connection and was really fascinated by it. Um, in fact, when she, you know, after I sent her paradigms for again, she sent me a, you know, emailed me and she said, it came about five hours ago. I read it already. It's very interesting. Then all up the case. I had no idea what I was doing was of such significance for Mormon studies. Thank you for sending me a copy. And for that matter, thanks for writing the book. You know, and then, you know, I sent her this copy of the paper and uh, glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem, and she decided, well, I'll just have to read the Book of Mormon. So she, she sat down and read the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price all in one day. And her comment was, I was amazed at how much I recognized. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I remember was the, and this is really from next week, because they talk about Lehi's dream, about the color of the white yes. waves. She she mentions that in yes. her other books. So yeah, um, when we when we talk about the first chapter of Lehi, one of the things that strikes me is okay. There's so much in this section, particularly about Nephi's journey to get the brass plate that that we want to get into. But the Book of Mormon and the small plate start off immediately with an apocalyptic vision of the sea. Now, we just talked about that when we talk about the book of Revelation this morning when we were sitting in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1, we have the vision of the Lord. And, and it, you know, our, our instructor mentioned uh, Elder McConkie and his article from 1975 about keys to understanding the book of Revelation. And he, he read something here in a tone that I've never heard before. But if you take this tone and apply it to the apocalyptic vision of Lehi, you get the same feeling. He says, if you have already fallen in love with John's presentation of the plan of salvation as it is set out in the apocalypse, you are one of the favored few in the church. If this choice experience is yet ahead for you, 
The day and hour is here to launch one of the most intriguing and rewarding studies in gospel scholarship in which any of us ever engage. Frankly, when you talk about Lehi's vision, he sees the pillar of fire. I mean, I, I, I re- the, the best thing about the collection of essays, Kevin, that you reviewed in January is its title. Um, it's mm-hmm. called it's called A Dream, A Rock, and a Pillar of Fire, reading First Nephi 1. And uh, yes. I'll, I'll tell you, I don't need any more than the title. That title pictures the entire <laughs> chapter for me, literally. And then, then he has the counsel. But you're right. Everything he sees goes against the the political basis of the time, which is why they threatened his life. I mean, they, they weren't going to mess around. They were changing the nature of everything they were doing there, and he was a threat to it. So they were going to kill him. And so right out of the gate, we get an apocalyptic vision. And so for me, that says, okay, here we are. And then we start this great journey with Nephi and so forth. And and as Don has pointed out in his book, we, we, we have a, a more temple-oriented, a more Jewish-oriented, a more Bible-oriented, particularly Old Testament-oriented version of the Book of Mormon than I think maybe a lot of us have seen before. So, Don? Yeah, so on First Nephi 1, it's so crucial, this context that it provides for the entire Book of Mormon And for me, we hit on this a little first hour, but I want to bring it into sharper relief. One of the most important verses of the Book of Mormon for understanding the book as a whole seems rather mundane. It's very familiar. It's 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, And it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, that's so familiar, right? But what does it actually mean? And Kevin alluded to its meaning in the first hour, and that is you have to understand how Zedekiah's reign commenced. What does this actually mean? What it means is Nebuchadnezzar II comes in and sends his armies to Jerusalem, lays siege, deposes the king, and installs a new king, and that king is Zedekiah. He's supposed to be a puppet. Yeah. And in the phrasing, in the phrasing used there, in the commencement of the year, is used elsewhere in the Book of Mormon. And there's one time when it's used, when it gives us an idea of exactly what it means, because it says in the commencement of the first year, and then it says it's talking about the second day of the first month of the year. So when the Book of Mormon uses this phrase, there's every reason to think it means immediately the commencement. We're basically at this beginning of this new year. And so what this means is the the Babylonian exile has begun. The diaspora or diaspora, the Jewish exile, like has actually started in a small way. It's a trickle that's about to become, you know, raging flood eight years later. And this is the context in which Lehi is giving his warnings The Book of Mormon is framed by the Jewish exile. And so all the you look at the losses that were suffered by the Jewish exiles when they're sent to Babylon. They lose their promised land. They lose their temple city. They lose Solomon's temple. They lose the Ark of the Covenant in Solomon's temple and the sacred relics that were associated with that. In fact, they probably already lost that, according to the Bible. Yeah. Right at this, this is the moment when they probably lost it because we're told there in the Bible that when Nebuchadnezzar II comes in that first time and deposes Jeconiah there. and puts Zedekiah on the throne, he takes all the treasures of gold yes. from the temple. What's the Ark of the Covenant made of? It's, it's, gold, it's a gold box. It's gold-plated. And so there's every reason to think that presence of the Lord that's, ensconced in and represented by the Ark of the Covenant and its relics is gone from the temple. So why did Lehi leave? Why did Lehi go out and do his own sacrifices in the wilderness? The temple's not valid anymore. That verse 4, that phrase, it's just so packed with meaning. So uh, the exiles also lose the Davidic monarchy, right, and so on. What did the Nephites lose Lehi's family on their, in their exile, 
they will they lose the biblical promised land they lose the temple city they lose you know the the ark of the covenant the temple Solomon's temple the ark of the covenant the davidic sacred monarchy what do they do when they go to their new world right on their exodus yeah one of the first things they build a temple they go to a new promised land right so they're replacing the old promised land for themselves they build they have a temple city the city of nephi and they build a temple patterned on they tell us solomon's temple they the, have the their first temple not yeah, the second right they have their own sacred relics that actually and this takes some laying out but i lay it out in the book it's actually once you see it you can't unsee it it's clear as day they have their own equivalents to the sacred relics that were in the ark of the covenant and the high priestly relics the most obvious well, have, one there they have the brass plates yeah you yeah. know instead of stone tablets right. they have they have brass and gold tablets the, in place of stone tablets they have right. the sword of laban right which all on the surface those don't sound like they're paralleling the biblical sacred relics, but when you actually look at the details, they parallel them systematically point by point. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen that when it comes to traditionally when we've seen that the Book of Mormon interpreters and breastplate obviously parallel the biblical high priest breastplate and Urim and Thummim. We've even called the Book of Mormon interpreters the Urim and Thummim because we see that connection so clearly. The other connections are actually there when you look at the details just as clearly. Mm -hmm. So after the first chapter, we have Lehi's life is threatened. Then yeah. he is commanded to leave in order to spare his life. Yes. And that's where the family dynamic comes into play, Kevin, because Laman and Lemuel don't want to go. Right. Okay. And this is where um, I've always believed anyway that, that the... It, especially after I read what Margaret Barker had to say about the Deuteronomist, that in my opinion, the split between Lehi and Laman and Lemuel to a certain degree was because Laman and Lemuel believed and accepted the political reforms of the Deuteronomist. Because what is their greatest claim against Nephi? What's it against Lehi? What's their greatest complaint? Our father is a visionary man. And yet the Deuteronomists. They, they don't want to have any truck with vision. Lehi tells them he has a vision and they want to kill it. So for me, that is, kind of explains that dynamic to a certain degree, but but that's limited because I I uh, was talking with uh, David Seeley about that, and he said, yes, he said there's probably, he believes there's probably a middle ground when we talk about the, the split between the Deuteronomists and, and Lehi and his people or the Nephites uh, because he said, Jesus loved Deuteronomy. He quoted it all the time, uh, and and so it's part of the scriptures. The question is just how you interpret those differences, and 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 they're pretty pretty significant, as Kevin has pointed out. So, and it's which edition of Deuteronomy, and who's who gets to to edit the version, and which you know, uh, it's like Jeremiah and Lehi both quoted a lot, but there's. There are just a few places where there's differences. Like when I read Friedman, he said that he made the claim in his book that he said that uh, like Jeremiah agrees with with Deuteronomy and the reformers, you know, 100 percent of the time, you know. And then, uh, but then when I read Barker, he said, no, there's a few places where it's different, and it turns out to be these things, you know, about yeah. the idea about vision, about the United Messiah, about the idea that uh, you know, the, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's you can see God face to face. That that's one of our biggest challenges with the Old Testament, though. It's, having a having a reliable text at, at any given point especially the farther back we yeah. go uh they're, they're compiled and so forth so thankfully we we have that catch-all phrase as far as it is translated correctly <laughs> which uh yeah. you know we, we could spend a lot of time on that the, the most important thing to point out about chapter two for me is where lehi or where nephi manages to soften his heart about what lehi says and he convinces Sam. He's not able to reach Laman and Lemuel. In fact, he, he never does. The only time they, they really comply is once they've been scared into it or intimidated into it, uh, and then it doesn't last. But Sam seems to have taken that to heart. W what do you think it is, Kevin and, and Don, that Nephi does in particular that enables him to do that based on, based on your life experiences and, and people you've come across? We'll go with Kevin first. 
Well, we've got uh, two stories in the Bible about people having an encounter with an angel. And in one case, it's like Alma, and he, the angel shows up and he repents. And in the case of Lamb and Lamuel, they see the angel, and they immediately start complaining. So it's not the angel that makes the difference. The angel, the difference is, uh, like in Alma's case, it's his life review. He looks at his own sins, which is what the Ezra does without an angel. And what Nephi is going to be doing is looking at his own self and you know, his trust in his father and seeking for himself, which he talks about later. You know, he, he wanted to know what his father knew. So it's what we do personally with it. And, and, and uh, if we look at our own sins, take the beam out of our own eye, then we can see clearly. But if we're insisting, no, you're wrong, you know, <laughs> Lehi's, Lehi's uh, you know, the crazy guy, we don't want to do this, and we know that Jerusalem is a great city and what's fall. Then it's they're they're working with pride and resentment rather than uh, looking at their own sins. Okay. Go so on. in chapter two, in verse sixteen, when Nephi is describing this process by which his own heart is softened, he tells us that he had great desires to know the mysteries of God. And that, for this reason, he asks, he cries unto the Lord. And later, of course, in First Nephi, when uh, Laman and Lemuel are very perplexed by their father's teachings, Nephi says, well, have you asked? And so, obviously, a, a key thing here is asking, but there's something that lies behind the asking for Nephi, and it's the desire to know. There's actually an interesting idea in the history of philosophy from a philosopher named Charles Peirce. Uh, he's a pragmatist, and he argues for something called fallibilism. And the idea of it is if we're always convinced that we're right already, then there's no need to inquire. There's no need to ask. There's no need to look. It's only to the extent that we realize the fallibility of our own ideas that we never have absolute truth already that we will look and ask, and Nephi is looking. Yeah, uh, Bruce McConkie mentioned that. For Joseph Fielding Smith, he specifically said, I never asked if the Book of Mormon was true, because it was. He, That was just a, a, a reality for him. That that ties into what you mm -hmm. were saying right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, then, <clears throat> like, when I've uh, run across something new, you know, I've, there's a narrative out there that a lot of people say, how come nobody told me this before? And there's a certain resentment about it. My response is always, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I wonder where I can go to find out more. And that's a valid response to it because, you know, I know from the you know, one thing I know from the outset is I don't know everything. So when mm -hmm. I learn something new, that shouldn't be unexpected. It's like, oh, okay, well, this is interesting. Let's, let's find out more about it. Yeah. And that's exactly what Nephi does. And Lehman and Lemuel know enough. Yeah, they, they're happy they, with what they got. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. at times they later say, "Well, God doesn't make that known to me. He'll, right. he'll, he'll talk to the prophet, he'll talk to Lehi or Nephi, but he won't talk to me." Yeah. And yet our our father yeah. talks to all of us. I think. In Second Nephi twenty nine, you know, it talks to the Lord talks to people who say a Bible, a Bible, right? They these people yeah. feel that they already have enough. So sure, if you're satisfied, you already feel like you know it. You know enough. You're not going to search. You're not going to be open. And Nephi is. He has a great. It starts with his great desire to know. So there are two things there. There's a there's a passion. There's a curiosity. There's a thirst for spiritual things, for divine things. And there's a humility. He doesn't assume that he already knows. Which Lynn and Lemuel, they are assuming that they already know. They don't need more. That, yeah. You know, that leads us into the next chapter, because uh, Lehi has another vision. He, they're, they're three days out. They've built their altar. They've kind of renamed the valley. They've renamed the, the river, and uh, they have to go back and get the brass plate. Yeah. And uh, the brass plates are the word of God. And and for me, it's it's fascinating. And, and the book I mentioned at the beginning of this hour, The Covenant, I, it's it's not clear as clear as it could be, but my my reading of Nephi's claim, I will go and do the thing which the Lord hath commanded, for me is covenantal language, or at least I believe Nephi treated it as such. 
because for me that was something that gave him the power to just go into the unknown and do what he did that we'll talk about here in chapter 4. So they go, they send Laman, they, they kind of cast lots, and while it sounds like they just rolled the dice, that was a form at that time of reading the divine. Mm-hmm. So they believed, I think, that Laman was called by God, or at least the, the Lord was pleased with Laman being the one to go ask for the plates. I, I don't think they just rolled the dice and it was like, hey, Laman, you got the short end of the stick, buddy. You get to go over there and talk to Laban. But he goes and he just asks. And, of course, Laban says, no, can't have those plates. You're a robber. Get out of here. And he chases him out. And then they go and they try and buy the plates. So they take all of their worldly possessions that they'd left behind. Once again, the spoils of Egypt, as it were, only in yeah. reverse. Yeah. Right. Voluntarily giving them right. to Laban, right. Right. and right. then right. 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 and they, um, you know, can't get him. He steals it. He runs them off. And then we have the story with the angel where they're beating him, and the angel comes and says, "Why are you beating your brother? Stop beating your brother." And then we go to chapter four, where Nephi undertakes by the power of the Spirit to just go into the dark alone and try and figure this out. And this is where we come into, well, a little more of the setting. Why is Laban drunk? What's he doing there on the ground? How does that come into play? And that kind of traces with some of the things that you found in your your research. Yeah, so this is in the Chapter 7 of my book on the last 116 pages, uh, most of which was published as this article, An Interpreter, a few weeks ago, a Passover setting for Lehi's Exodus. So when you mentioned there the kind of spoils of Egypt in reverse. So in the narrative, biblical narrative of the Exodus, um, at the time of Passover, the original Passover, right, when the children of Israel are passed over by the angel of death, but then the Egyptian firstborn are not passed over, right? They are they are slain. Um, this horrible incident prompts the... Egyptians to just get rid of the children of Israel. They're like, here, take our gold and silver, you know, and get out of here, please. Um, And so, you know, fascinatingly, um, it's been noted so much that there are parallels of Lehi's exodus in the Book of Mormon with that biblical exodus. And so you've got an inversion, you've got a parallel here with an inversion that the Nephi, Lehi's family, they are willing to give their gold and silver to the Egyptian, as it were. You know, Nephi explicitly compares Laban to the Egyptians. And so you have this Exodus, in fact, Passover theme, or the Passover, part of the Passover story is being paralleled in reverse. And then um, you have other... Exodus elements, you have other Passover elements. And and you raise the question, why is Laban drunk? So our Book of Mormon text, 1 Nephi, it tells us that he's drunk. And it tells us, actually, he'd been out by night with the elders of the Jews. You'll note that he seems, if this is just going out carousing, he has rather high-profile drinking buddies. And they, um, <laughs> they come back. Um, ne- Nephi pretends to be him coming back and tells Zoram he wants to take the scriptures out to the gates of the city to these guys, these elders whom he's been drinking with. Zoram doesn't appear to bat an eye. Somehow this seems normal to him. Well, why? What's going on here? So in this interview that Joseph Smith Sr. grants in 1830 that's reported by Fayette Latham, uh, Joseph Smith Sr. tells Fayette Latham the story of the Book of Mormon, but he adds details. And the detail that he adds here is that Laban was drunk because of a festival, that there's a feast being celebrated in the city at the time. And so there, there are those clues that we mentioned to our Passover context. And that Passover setting, or a festival setting in general even, would account for the celebration, right, the drunkenness, going out by night with the elders, the fact that Zoram doesn't seem to bat an eye, 
at, you know, taking the scriptures out for celebration. And notice that Laban's kind of dressed up, too, for <laughs> for going out to drink. He's in armor. He's got his sword, you know, uh, like ceremonial dress. Well, the first and last days of Passover were holy convocations. They were special communal occasions of celebration. Coming right out of this, Lehi is teaching his sons. He appears to actually be, well, well so his sons come back home uh, out to the wilderness and um, to their tent, and he offers sacrifice. Uh, might suggest, again, a festival context. Um, Lehi teaches his sons about the Lamb of God, that the Messiah will be the Lamb of God. Well, in chapter 10, when he teaches them that, everything else that he's telling them is actually expounding what he's already said to the Jews in First Nephi chapter 1 from his throne theophany. So that suggests that this Passover-related content, this Lamb of God content, is also echoing Lehi's initial theophany, which I place in the, the season immediately preceding the, the, the early part of the Passover month. So this Passover setting, if that's what we're seeing here, which it certainly appears, this would explain so much about the Nephites' understanding of the Messiah as the Lamb of God, which would be certainly an offensive sort of idea to the Jews if they were going to believe in any Messiah. They don't want to. They wouldn't want to believe in a one who's a sacrificial lamb, right? Like the Passover lamb. Um, there, it, we tell, we say that the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. We've added that as a fitting subtitle to the book. And yet, when you first open up the book, is it talking about directly about Jesus? We're well, talking about this guy in ancient Israel and how he's going to be destroyed there in Jerusalem. But the Lord warns him, if there's already a Passover context and a revelation that the Messiah is the Lamb of God then Lehi's own temporal deliverance is a type of the deliverance of humankind by the Messianic Lamb of God. So this this kind of new information helps reframe the Book of Mormon. It really is, from page one, a book about Christ. It's another testament of Jesus Christ. Well, and another thing that strikes me is that, you know, Laban is killed. And yeah. there's yeah. a lot we yeah, can yeah, say yeah. about yeah. that or not. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. He's killed so that the word of God can be given to the Nephites in, in right. the form of the brass plates. Right. Just like the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed yes, so exactly. that the Israelites could be free to go on their exodus because right. Lehi couldn't leave without the brass plates. He needed to take the brass plates with him right. for a lot of different reasons. And the Spirit gives a rationale yes. to Nephi for this. And you look at the words he used, those, okay, mm-hmm. these, these familiar words. It is better that one man should perish than a nation. Have you heard that before? Well, Caiaphas <laughs> uses it. Caiaphas uses those words. And the setting is John, the Gospel of John, Caiaphas uses these words. And the Gospel of John actually takes this very seriously and says, Caiaphas here was acting in his role as the high priest prophesying. Yeah. And the setting that John gives, it's Passover. Yeah. And so the spirit Telling Nephi to kill Laban is using the same words as Caiaphas' Passover prophecy in the New Testament. Why? A Passover yeah, setting would certainly help to account for that. And yeah. give it what, is, what does Margaret say about that uh, statement from Caiaphas, Kevin, in her uh, King of the Jews book? Oh, I'd have to look it up. I've got it on my shelf, but it wouldn't take too long. It'd be worth looking up, though. Yeah. Uh, and another related thing with this is, is what had just happened to Jehoiakim when the uh, there's, a, there's an essay in uh, Pressing Forward with the Book of Mormon that Jack Welch put together some years ago where he talks about uh, Jehoiakim was, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had come and demanded that the Jewish council surrender to Jehoiakim that the nation or the nation would be destroyed. And Jeho- Jehoiakim says, can you sacrifice one life for another? And they say, thus did your ancestors do to see the son of virtue. So this uh, along with the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the uh, kind of forecast of what Caiaphas is going to say, it was a live issue in Lehi's Jerusalem. So that's fascinating. I didn't know that about Jehoiakim, uh, Zedekiah's predecessor. But that, again, given First Nephi chapter one verse four, 
When did that happen? That happened immediately yeah, the... before Lehi has his vision, makes his exodus, and this brass plates incident ha- happened. So that's in the immediate background here. That's fascinating. I, I, you know, yes. we, we always look at Lehi's journey out of Jerusalem that's taking place. I mean, they go out three days, and then the, he makes the sacrifice, builds the altar and everything. And then it, it appears to me that he's there for a while before he sends the boys back to get the brass plate. But your timeline, Don, seems to indicate that it's right there during that short period of time when the Passover festival is going. So that's, that's what I'm arguing. And what I'm presenting here yeah. is, is a model, right? And so in, in doing history... We don't have direct access to the past. You know, maybe if we had our, if when the Earth is a celestial Urim and Thummim, we can look in it, sure, right? But right now, what we have are fragments of the past. And what we do as historians is we take those fragments of the past and we piece them together, like puzzle pieces, right? And we see how do they best fit, what model best explains what we're seeing there. And this model brings quite a bit of light to the early Book of Mormon text and builds on what Justice Smith Sr. said of what was in the last pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Kevin and Don, what do you think caused Nephi to be able to have the strength to, to pull this up? I mean, I, I talked about what my theory was about the, the covenant language. He'd made a covenant with God and he was just going to keep it. But what else might there be? I, I have a, a comment on that for sure. Um, so if you think about what things that happen in the Book of Mormon do people find disturbing, what thing that a prophet does in the Book of Mormon have, do people complain about being a, dis- oh, yeah, a morally it's... disturbing thing? It's this. Well, yes. There's a defenseless man, unconscious, drunk, lying on the ground, and the prophet, this prophet, Nephi, cuts his head off. So... Um, where is that narrative found in the Book of Mormon? It's the very beginning, very far, yeah. right? In fact, in the original 1830 chaptering, the, the original chaptering in the original chapter manuscripts one. of the Book of Mormon, this is chapter one. So literally, chapter one, first narrative of the Book of Mormon is when the most disturbing thing in the book is presented to the reader. I actually don't think that's an accident. I think that's providential shaping of this. There's a message there. This is laying down a challenge to the reader. And that challenge is, if this book were just giving you a bunch of nice ideas that everybody could go along with, you wouldn't really have to make a decision about the book. You wouldn't have to commit one way or another. This is telling you that you, like Nephi, anyway, you have to commit, right? you you got to be all in. You have to find out for yourself, judge for yourself, is this really God? So when Nephi... I've seen arguments, and these may be right, okay, that Nephi is actually justified under the Mosaic law in killing Laban. What I find interesting is that the passage there isn't appealing to the law. It's not no. saying, you know, it's a moral decision. Because of the law, you can kill this guy. It's okay. Instead, it's a Lehi. I mean, Nephi attributes it to the spirit. So it's sort of like. Paul, law versus spirit, right? And the purpose here is to get the law. They're trying to get the law. That's what's written on the brass plates, the commandments of the law that he needs for his children. In order to get the law, he has to kind of go around the law, maybe break the law, but certainly do something different than just what he's being told by the law. He's following the spirit. So Mm -hmm. there's a kind of theme of law and spirit and whether, whether this might be legally justified in some way, Nephi's not presenting it that way. He's making his decision based on the fact that the Spirit tells him something, he thinks about it, it actually makes sense, he realizes he needs to do it, and he does it. Well, he, he resists a little bit. The Spirit tells him more than once. Yes. I mean, in, uh, and we have that famous writing from Brother Nibley where he has a section of Arab students who are mm-hmm. very frustrated with this because they mm-hmm. say, why are you waiting? Huh. That's what you have to do. But uh, anyway, Kevin, what what do you think it was that gave Nephi the strength? Well, I just think the presence of the Spirit, that he, he was engaged in this conversation with the Spirit. And, and even though he didn't understand fully, part of the process for his own growth process is that he had to do this thing that he didn't want to do. 
you know, it was a sacrifice for him to do it. And he had to give that. You know, it's not a general principle, you know, go out and kill political figures that bother you. It's, it's in this specific instance. Well, there is, this is, what he was at, the, there yeah. is the there yeah. is the Nephi and Goliath yeah. element. Yeah, there's definitely that. So, so to call yeah. that out a little bit, yeah. Um, yeah. So David... That's how, well, that's yeah. him telling the story using that to help him, to help us understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, the, yeah. but clearly the brass plates are super significant. What is it about them that that causes that? That that well, I mean, we, we know they're the word of God. We know that they don't want to lose their language, but there's something about the brass plates. And I believe it's their content, mm-hmm. um, as well yeah. as their the nature of their being the word of God, literally. Yeah. That sends a message to us about. Yeah. I mean, it's this. Yeah. It, it, it is. You cannot distinguish it between what Nephi just did, as Don was just describing, where you have the disturbing incident with Nephi and Laban, mm-hmm. and it's inextricable from the brass plate or the word of it, right. which Nephi couldn't get them by asking, simply asking, couldn't get them by buying it. He right. had to be led by the Spirit to right. it, and yes. then the Spirit made him do something he was, well, let's just say outside his comfort zone. <laughs> in order to achieve it. Quite now, far. Thankfully, outside, yeah. we're not asked to make the same sacrifice today. But uh, just really quick, for about a minute apiece, how important are the scriptures to us? We have a lot of learning. We've done a lot of research. We talk about all these other things. But at the heart of it is the impact of the scriptures. I, I mean, I've read a lot of things. I study a lot of history and everything. I do not know the Book of Mormon well, my son, who has read it every day for 23 years. Since he was 13, he had church leaders mm-hmm. down in St. George who encouraged him to do it, challenged him to do it, and done it ever since. Mm-hmm. He knows the Book of Mormon backwards and forwards from a doctrinal standpoint, from a belief standpoint, ties everything together in ways that I can't comprehend, and it has totally made a difference in his life. His children, mm. and, and my life too, just from that example. So, I know that the Word of God is really the centerpiece of all this, and and it's worth what Nephi went through to get it. Yeah. But but how about for each of you? What is it about the Scriptures that that really can do that in about one minute apiece? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with Kevin first. One minute, Kevin. Well, I, I just think of the passage in Third Nephi when the Lord's there and He's teaching the people, and He just says, "I perceive that you're weak and you cannot understand all my words at once." You know, go home and prepare your mind. And he tells them to search the script. You know, search spread of the words of Isaiah. Go home and search them. That exercise of reading and reflecting on it that we we have to do ourselves, and it does change our minds. Uh, there's the words expand your mind, enlarge your soul, and those things. It it takes that personal work to do it. Okay, Don. So the Book of Mormon gives a couple examples of this value of the Scripture. So you notice, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Nephi is trying to trade uh, gold and silver for brass, right? <laughs> um, the Nephites have the Scriptures. The Mulekites don't. One of these people loses their complete sense of identity because they don't have the Scriptures. So the nation could perish for want of the Scriptures. In Alma, we're told that the... Uh, brass plates have enlarged the memory of this people. So think about this. Writing books, scripture, it's actually a technology of enlarging memory. You know, our minds only hold so much at any given moment. But the scriptures, with this, this technology of writing, it's like we have a larger cultural memory, a larger personal memory. We can draw on the experiences of people across thousands of years, their wisdom, their perspective, their experience with God, instead of just relying on what we know right at this moment. Okay, thanks for being with us. Once again, that's uh, Don Bradley, our special guest. Be sure and pick up The Lost 116 Pages, published by Greg Coford Books. Kevin Christensen, my co-host. That's it for me, Terry Hutchinson. Join us next week for Foundation Radio. Thank you for listening.